Welcome to the Jongets Games tutorial for Veiled Fate. In this video, I'll be teaching you the rules to the game as we play through the first out of three overall rounds. Now, I would like to ask that if you end up enjoying this video, that you please click the like button for it down below, as well as the subscribe button for the channel. In addition to that, if you'd like to directly support the channel and the creation of future videos like this one, then please go to jongetsgames.com support. There you'll find a bunch of ways that you can really help things out, and some of them come with cool benefits like voting on a few of the videos that I film each month. All right, let's jump into the game. Out here, the game is fully set up and ready to play for our four different players. Before we begin, I would like to ask that you please turn on the Klingon subtitles. I might make mistakes as I am showing you the game, and those will let me put corrections on the screen where you should be able to see them. The last thing I'd like to mention is the fact that I am filming with a prototype version of the game today, so the art and components are not necessarily what you'll find in the final version. I'd also like to point out that these colored cubes do not come with the game. I am simply using them to make it easier to tell whose turn it is for the purposes of this tutorial. Well, let's start things off with a brief overview of the game. Each player is a divine being who has sired a demigod who is now in the realm of man. Now, the identity of each player's offspring is unknown to their opponents, and as part of setup, we all drew one card from a stack of nine. Now, we are going to be playing as the red player today, and as you can see, our demigod offspring is Isabel, who is right over here. Now, the ultimate goal for each player is that their specific demigod offspring has the most renown compared to all of the other demigod offspring of the other players. Of course, the identity of each offspring is hidden, so as we are playing the game, we are trying to not make it too obvious which demigod we are favoring, because there are many ways to reduce the renown of specific demigods. Now, the way we are going to reach our goals involves spending our turns moving the demigods around so that they can go on various quests, as well as potentially work their way out from the underworld back into the city in the center of the board. Now, when we send demigods onto quests, we are going to influence those quests by putting fate cards down, which will then be used later to indicate the results of the quest once it is completed. In addition to influencing quests, players can also spend their turns using their fate cards to activate a variety of different god powers, which can have significant impacts on the current state of play. The game itself is going to last over three overall ages, and within each age there is a card which dictates special rules or conditions which pertain to that age. Each age will come to an end once all players have passed, or once all of the quests have been completed, and once again, after three ages are done, the player whose specific demigod has the highest amount of renown will be the winner. Alright, I think it's now time to start playing the game, and as I mentioned before, today we are going to be controlling the red player over here, and our demigod offspring is Isabel. Now I'm going to leave this face up so that we remember, but of course this is effectively face down so our opponents do not know what this card says. As you can see, we have the starting player token right over here, which means we are going to take the first turn. But before that happens, we as the starting player have to reveal and read the age one card. So let's focus over here and we can flip up the age one card and it says Arbiter. Now over here, it says at the end of the age, the first player is going to choose three demigods and all other players are going to vote on whether or not those demigods are going to gain or lose renown. Obviously, this is a powerful decision for the first player, and that token can move once per age, and I'll explain how later on in the tutorial. At this point, we are now ready to start taking actions, and as the starting player, we of course will take the first turn of the game. Now, on a player's turn, we are going to get two actions, and for each action, there are two options. The first is we can move a demigod out on the map, and the second is we can use a god power. Now, I think for our first action, let's move a demigod. So, let's focus on the main board. Now, when we move a demigod, we can select any that is not locked into a quest. Now, whenever a demigod is on top of a quest, you cannot move them off. They are locked in until the quest is completed, which will then discard the quest and then put that demigod into the region. There are ways to remove or move demigods on uncomplete quests, but those have to do with god powers, which I will talk about later. Now, at the moment, there are all nine of the demigods in the center of the board, which is the city, so none of them are locked. Now, I think what we want to do is start by moving Sagara right here. Now, we don't know if anyone is affiliated with Sagara at this point, but I don't want to move Isabel just yet, because I feel like that might be telegraphing our intentions a little bit too much. So, we are going to move Sagara into a new area, and whenever you leave the city, you can go into the coast, the forest, the canyons, the desert, the volcano, or the mountains. You'll notice I did not say the abyss or the pools. That is because these areas are special. The demigods only go down into the abyss when the smite god power happens, and I'll explain the details of that later on in the tutorial. 
So there are six different regions that we can move Sagara to at this point. Now, it's worth noting that once you have a demigod in one of the regions and you decide to move with them, then you can go to an adjacent region or back into the city. That means if Sagara was here and we wanted to move them, they could go over here or the city, or you'll notice the coast as well as the mountains have this uh, path connecting them. That means the coast is adjacent to the mountains and the mountains are adjacent to the coast. Once again, you skip over this part because you can only enter this region through the smite action. Now, I don't think we actually want to send Sagara over to the coast. Instead, let's head over here to the canyons. Let's focus on this area because whenever we arrive with a demigod, we can either put them into the overall region or we could place them directly down onto a quest as long as there is a spot that is eligible for them. Now, if a demigod is already on a location, then that spot is blocked off. But as you can see, the goblin horde is currently empty. This means we could put Sagara down here or here as well as this middle spot. Now, there are special restrictions on some of the quests, and for the Goblin Horde, the special restriction here shows a orange dot, which does match the base of Sagara. That means Sagara is the only demigod who can ever be placed right over here, and I figure let's go ahead and meet that condition. It's worth noting that there are two other restrictions that can come into play when placing demigods onto quests. Over here, you'll notice that there is an owl, a bull, and a cat icon, and that dictates the type of god that can be placed into these spots. All nine of the gods are split into three overall groups, and the gods themselves show the applicable icon on the bottom as well as the side, so you know which type can go into which of those icons. The other type of restriction are these arrows, and that simply means that you must fill this spot in first. Once demigod is there, this can be filled, and then finally the bottom spot on this quest will be the last one to be filled. Let's focus back over on the Goblin Horde, because as soon as you add a Demigod to a quest, you then have to add a Fate card from your hand onto that specific spot in that region. Now, we have these five at the start of the game, and I think let's place this card down into that pile. Now, this is going to go face down, and when this is revealed, once the quest is completed, this is going to add two more random cards into the resolution of this quest. The reason we are putting this in here is because we don't actually care about the renown for Sagara at this point, so adding a little bit of chaos is not a problem. We want to keep these in our hand, which can uh, cause different types of results for the quest to happen for when we care a little bit more about the results. Now, I will describe the details of resolving a quest later on in the tutorial, and at this point, we can now take our second action. Now, we could use one of these god powers, but I don't think any make sense just yet, so I'll cover those soon. And instead, for our second action, I think let's actually move Isabel to a quest. In this case, I think we will go to close the rift. As you can see, Isabel has the owl mark on the bottom, and that will match up with this spot right here. And when we look at this quest card, you can see on one side it shows a sickle, which is a negative renown icon, and on the other side is a 2 omega, which is a positive 2 renown icon. When we focus in a little more, you'll see there is a feather over the white side of the quest and a scorpion over the dark side. And if we look at our fate cards once again, you can see that we have scorpions and feathers left in our hand. Now, we of course have to add one fate card to this pile right here, and I think that it makes more sense to gain renown than lose it. Now, once this quest is full, we will evaluate all of the fate cards in here, and whichever side has more, whether that be the feathers or the scorpions, will dictate the effect on each demigod. This means we are quite motivated to have the scorpion side win over here, so I think let's put this double scorpion card down, which counts as two once the quest is completed. Now, it is true that we are trying to hide which demigod we are favoring, but it does also make sense not to ignore the demigod we care about the most. So I think putting that there is probably okay, and maybe on our next turn, we don't affect either of these demigods to make it harder for our opponents to pick up which one we care about. Well, we have taken both of our actions, which means our turn is over, and now play moves over to the yellow player. For their first action, they have decided to move Belan, and they are going to send them over here to the Goblin Horde. Once there, they'll put Balan onto the top open spot. After that, they of course have to add one fate down. And then with their second action, they are going to move Agamar up here to the canyons to occupy the last spot. They of course have to add another fate card down into that area. And now we can see that the Goblin Horde quest is fully occupied. The moment this happens, that quest is going to be resolved. And the first thing that we have to do is look up at the top to this number here. Now that will range from 0 up to 2, and that is the number of new cards that have to be added into this fate pool. 
The way this works is the player who is currently active now has to decide which of their opponents has to add another card into that pool. If the number was two, then the active player would select two opponents, and each opponent would have to add one card into the pool. Now it looks like the yellow player has decided that green needs to add one of their fate cards in, and they've decided to go with this one. Now, after the green player was forced to play this card, they get to draw a new card from the top of the deck, so overall their hand size did not actually go down. So, the extra card coming from the green player can go onto the stack, and now the active player can take all of these fate cards and shuffle them up, and then reveal them one at a time. So, the first one is a feather, the second one is a double feather, so there are three feathers in the pool. After that, there is a scorpion, and then there is the plus two fate card that we put down on our turn. Remember, this means we have to draw that many cards from the top of the deck and add those into the pool. So the first of these is a scorpion, and the second one is also a scorpion. Now, at this point, we have to count up the number of scorpions and feathers. In this case, it appears there are three scorpions and three feathers, which means there is a tie. Whenever a tie happens, we then have to consult the fate coin. It has a scorpion on one side and a feather on the other, and now the active player can flip this over, and then whatever side shows is going to be added into the pool. In this case, that is a scorpion, so there are four scorpions to the three feathers, which means the scorpion side of the Goblin Horde quest is now going to be performed. So let's focus in, and each row in the quest is going to be performed, starting at the top and then moving down. So beginning over here with Balan, we can see the effect involves spinning the coin once again. On this icon, you can see if it shows up as a white feather, then Balan will gain one renown, and if it shows up as a scorpion, then Balan is going to lose one renown. So let's see what they get, and it's a feather. So Balan is going to gain one renown. With this in mind, we have to find Balan's renown marker and move it up one space on the renown track. Now, whenever a demigod's renown goes up or down, you put them to the front of the line of the area that they just went into. So that means Balan is currently at the front of the one renown spot. With this in mind, you can now see that the positioning of these renown tokens is important within their given sections. Now, if there is a tie between demigods within a renown area, the token that is farthest up will break the tie. So currently, Klar over here has the highest value zero renown. Let's now move on to Sagara's row, and while there is a coin symbol here, the icons on it are different. Now this does mean that the active player has to flip the coin, and they got a feather. So if we look over here, if there had been a scorpion, then Sagara would have lost one renown, but since there is a feather, that means instead the smite action will be performed. Now the first thing that happens when smite hits a demigod is we have to move that demigod to the abyss. As you can see, that's right over here, and remember, demigods cannot be moved into the abyss with a standard move. The only way they enter the abyss is when a smite action hits them. The next part of a smite action involves finding that god's renowned marker, and it is then moved to the back of the line within the same renowned spot. So the amount of renown that Sagara had did not change, but they are now worse off when it comes to the tiebreaker within that given renown slot. Finally, we can look to the last column, where Agamar is now going to gain two renown. So they will go from zero up to two, and that puts them in first place, and clearly they made out the best from this Goblin Horde quest. At this point, the quest is completed, so we can now discard all of the fate cards associated with it, and we can also discard the quest itself. Now we are going to put any demigods that were on that quest down into that region where they are now unlocked, which means a standard move action can now move them. Well, the yellow player's turn is done, which means the green player can go. For green's first action, they want to move Sagara. Now, they are currently in the abyss, and when you move out of the abyss, you have to follow this arrow, which brings you up to the pools. Now, there is this symbol right here, which is the draw one fate symbol, and that is going to be performed by the player who moved the demigod from the abyss to the pools. So, since green moved Sagara, they can now draw the top card from the deck. That will get added into their hand of five cards, and it's worth noting that players have a maximum hand size of eight, and if you reach the maximum, then you can no longer draw cards until you discard back down under. With Green's second action, they would like to move Sagara again. As you can see, they are in the pools, and the only place you can move to from the pools is right back into the city. You are not even allowed to go back down into the abyss. So Sagara is going to enter the city, and as you can see, this icon is right here, which means the current player can discard one of their fate cards and then draw a new one from the top of the deck. In this case, they will discard a single feather and then draw the top card into their hand. 
Now that that is done, the next thing that the green player has to do is consult the city card. Now the reason for that is because whenever any demigod enters the city, the active player then has to move the city token up once. At the start of each age, the token is off to the side, so the first time within an age that a demigod re-enters the city, we will take this token and place it onto the first slot on this track. Now, any time in the future when a demigod enters the city, this will then move along with the arrows, and whenever this token covers up any icons, the active player will have to perform the action of that icon. It is worth noting that once this token has moved all the way down to the bottom, this city card will be discarded, and we will not see a new one until the start of the next age, so once that happens, any more demigods entering the city will not have to perform any city actions. The final thing I'd like to mention about city cards is that as part of setup, you always put an altar style card out, which just has six slots on it. But later on in the game, when we draw new ones, they have the possibility of including new conditions to the gameplay. As you can see, Machinations right here does have six slots on it, but it also says while this card is active, when you move a demi back into the city, you may add a vote to any quest. Now, there are many of these city cards, which will affect the overall rules for as long as they are face up in the city. Well, green is done, which means the blue player can go, and for their first action, they have decided to use a god power. Now, one of these should be familiar to you. That is smite right in the middle. The effect of smite is the exact same as the smite action that we saw that came from the Goblin Horde quest earlier on. Now, the cost to perform one of these god powers is a number of fate cards from your hand equal to the number on the left side. So in order to smite a demigod out on the board, that would cost two cards. Now, in this case, the blue player decides they actually want to go with Omniscience. Now, that is going to cost them two Fate cards, and when we focus in on the action, it says they can shuffle a card from the Fate deck into a Quest Vote pile without looking at it, and then they can examine the Vote pile. So, they have to discard two of their cards. In this case, they are discarding a single Feather and a single Scorpion card. And then they have to choose a voting pile. Now, I don't think anyone is surprised to see them pick this one over at the forest, considering this is the only one that has a card in it. So they will add a random card from the deck into this pile, then shuffle these up and examine both of them. After looking, that has finished up their first action. And with their second action, they are going to move Pentha from the city into the forest. They could leave Pentha off to the side, but they want to add them onto the Close the Rift quest. As you can see, Pentha has a bowl on the bottom, which is going to match with that spot, so Pentha is going to be added to that location there. Of course, once they do this, they have to add one Fate card to the pile. With Blue's turn done, it's time for us to go. And part of me really wants to move a demigod over here to finish the Close the Rift quest, because if we add the Scorpion from our hand to this vote pile, we would make it more likely that we would get the two renown with Isabel. Now my concern is we don't want to telegraph too much that we are favoring Isabel. If we keep doing things with one specific demigod, that might give it away. So I think maybe we will play it a little bit cool right now, and instead, let's move Belan into the city. When that happens, we have to move this token forward once, and that means we can draw a single card from the top of the deck. So that is certainly a good thing. We are back to four cards. And at this point, we have one action left to take. Now, we don't actually have to take this action. Instead, we could just pass, and then our turn is over, and the next player can go. It's important to note that if you end up passing for both of your actions, then that is going to push you into a rest action overall, and whenever you rest, that is going to stop you from taking any further actions in the round. It's worth noting the first player to rest is going to take the starting player token for the next age of the game. It's worth noting that there are two other ways that a player can be forced into resting. The first of these is if they spend their last card on their turn, even if that last card is on their first action, then they are forced to rest. And the other way you are forced to rest is if on your entire turn you do not gain or spend any fate cards during that turn, then you must rest. This means if we passed right now, we would not be forced into resting because we did already gain one card into our hand. After considering our options, I think let's not pass at this point, and let's maybe try to throw our opponents off the trail a little bit by moving a demigod that we have not moved so far. At this point, let's go with Naka right here, and we can send them down to the mountains, and in particular onto the Flames of the Abyss quest. Now, they do have to go onto the top spot here, and as you can see, if the Scorpion side happens, then a Smite action will hit Naka. If the Feather side happens, then Naka will gain a Renown, which could potentially help one of our opponents, but once again, at this point in the game, I'm trying to throw people off the scent. We do, of course, have to add a card down, so let's put a Scorpion in there, because we don't want to accidentally help an opponent out who might actually care about Naka's Renown. Well, that's finished our turn, so now Yellow can go. 
and for their first action, they want to move Sagara from the city into the mountains, and in particular onto the Flames of the Abyss quest. They, of course, have to place it onto the next spot because this quest has arrows on it. Next up, they have to add a Fate card onto the voting pile, and that's finished up their first action. And for their second action, they have decided to activate a God Power. The one they are going with is Influence, and that is going to cost them a single Fate card from their hand. When we look at the details of this action, it says after placing a Fate card on a quest, you may add an additional Fate card. This action must be taken immediately after voting on a quest. Both still require an action. Well, they did just vote on this quest, so now they are going to discard this Add to Fate card in order to add a new one into this voting pile, so they have added two into this pile on their turn. At this moment, we can see that Yellow has no Fate cards in their hand anymore, which means they are forced to rest. This means they will take the first player token for the next age because they are the first player to rest, and now they are not going to take any more turns for the rest of this age. It's worth noting that if an age comes to the end and no players have rested, then the starting player token will stay with the player who had it before, and that is only going to happen if all of the quests are resolved before any player rests. Well, Yellow's turn is done, so now Green can go. And with their first action, they want to move Klar over to the Volcano and onto the Treaty Negotiation quest. After that, they have to add a card, and they'll go with this one here. Now they have one more action left that they can take, and they've decided to move Namari onto the Treaty Negotiation as well. That means they once again have to add a card onto the stack, and they're going to add this one here. So that's finished up a pretty quick turn for the green player, which means it's time for the blue player to go. Now it looks like they only have two cards left in their hand at this point. And with their first action, they want to send Balan over to Treaty Negotiation. After that, they have to add a Fate card into the voting pool, and we can see that this quest is now full, so it now has to be completed. As you can see, Treaty Negotiation has a zero on top, which means no more Fate cards are going to be added into this pool, so now this can be shuffled up. The blue player can reveal these now. There is one Scorpion, a second Scorpion, and a third Scorpion. So that means the Scorpion side definitely wins, and that also means that both the green and blue players only put Scorpions in over here, which certainly gives us some information as far as their intentions for helping specific demigods. Well, Klar is now going to gain two Renown because the Scorpion side was activated, which will bring them up to two, and that puts them in first place, pushing down Agamar. Next up, Namari is going to lose one Renown, but as you can see, Namari currently has zero. When this happens, you simply move that demigod's marker to the back of the line. Lastly, Balan is going to gain one renown, which will put them into first place. After that, these fate cards can be discarded, as well as the quest card. And now Blue can take another action if they want. Currently, they have one card in front of them, and they have decided to pass on their second action, which means it's now time for us to go. Well, we currently have three cards in front of us. And I think it's time to complete Close the Rift. That is going to take a cat type of demigod. So let's go ahead and choose Apony over here. Then we can move them onto that slot. And then we do have to add a fate card. We still would like Isabel to gain renown instead of lose it. So I think let's add a scorpion into the pile. Next up, we can see that the quest is full, which means it's time to complete it. Now it does have a 2 up here, which means we have to select 2 opponents to each add 1 card into the Fate voting pile. Now the first opponent that I think we should choose is Yellow. The reason for this is because they don't have any Fate cards in front of them, and that means they are simply going to draw a Fate card from the top of the deck. They can then look at it, and then they'll put it down into that pile. So that means Yellow did not actually have a decision to be made here, so it was kind of like a random card instead of choosing an opponent who could potentially spoil this for us. After that, we do have to choose one other opponent, and I think let's go with blue. They have just one card, so they are forced to add that into the pile, and then they are going to draw another one from the top of the deck. So much like yellow, they didn't have a choice in the matter as far as what card went down into the pile. Next up, we have to shuffle up the voting pile and then start revealing these cards. The first one is a scorpion, which is good. We do want the scorpions to win. Uh, then there is two feathers, which is not something we want to see. After that, there is two scorpions, and then another scorpion, so that is four to two, and then there is a plus two cards from the fate deck. So we can draw one, and it's a double scorpion, which is definitely the kind of thing we want to see, and then a feather, and finally, one more card, which is a double feather. Now we can count this up. 
There appears to be five feathers and then six scorpions. So fortunately for us, the scorpion side is going to win, and that means Isabel is going to gain two renown instead of lose one renown, which is what would have happened if the feathers had won. Uh, so let's take the two renown, which will bring Isabel up to first place at the moment. After that, we can see over here that Pentha is going to lose two renown. Currently, they have zero, though, so they're just going to go to the back of the line on the zero spot. Finally, we can see that Apony is going to gain one renown, which will bring them to the one spot. Next up, we can discard all of these fate cards as well as the quest. And that's finished our first out of two possible actions this turn. We do have two cards left over at this point, and I think let's pass to see what the green player does. We know that yellow already rusted, so that means now that we are done with our turn because we passed on the second action, green will go. After considering their options, they are going to start by sending Isabel into the city. We can see that's going to move this token down, and now we have to flip the fate coin. If it's a feather, then nothing will happen, and if it is a scorpion, then Isabel will be hit with a smite action. So, let's see what happens, and it's a scorpion. So, Isabel is hit with a smite action, and then this token will cover up that spot. Once Isabel arrives in the abyss, their renown marker is going to go to the back of the line within their given slot. After that, Green has one more action, and they are going to move Agamar into the city, that means that they will get to draw another card from the top of the deck, and they are back up to a hand size of 5, which is where everyone started at the beginning of the age. The green player's turn is over, which means blue can go, and it appears they have decided they are simply going to rest, so they will not take any actions at this point or for the rest of the age. With this in mind, that means it's once again time for us to go. Now, I think we want to potentially throw people off the trail of us favoring Isabel at this point, so let's go ahead and move... Namari up here. We are going to send them into the city, and the reason for that is because that will move this token down, and that will give Namari one renown. Now, we are hoping that none of our opponents actually care about Namari. Uh, we're not exactly sure just yet, but so far, nobody seems to be favoring them. So, Namari will gain one renown, which puts them to the front of the line in the one renown spot. After that, we have one action left, and there are two ways we can draw another card. We can move Isabel up to the pools, or we can move somebody else into the city. And I think we should not move Isabel because we are continuing to try and hide that we are favoring her. With that in mind, let's move Apony into the city, and we can then draw a card, and we have added a scorpion to our hand. Alright, we are done, and yellow has rested already, which means the green player gets to go again. With their first action, they are going to send Agamar into the mountains. That will go down here onto that spot in Flames of the Abyss, and then they'll add this fate card into the voting pile. And then with their second action, they are going to send Apony over here into the Flames of the Abyss as well, and this is the card that they'll add to the pile. So that means this quest is completed, and now they have to ask one player to add a card into this voting stack. They can choose any of their opponents, and they've decided to go with blue, so that means this card will go in there, and then blue will get another card from the top of the deck to replace it. Next up, green can shuffle the voting pile. And now let's see what happens. That is one feather, a scorpion, another feather, a feather, a scorpion, and a double scorpion. Well, that looks to be three feathers and four scorpions. So if we look over here, it looks like Naka will be hit by a smite action. That means they are sent to the abyss and their renown marker goes to the back within their given slot. Next up, Sagara is going to gain one renown, which puts them to the front of the one renown spot. And now for this last row, there are two demigods and one symbol in the middle. The way this works is the demigod on the side that is being performed is going to do the icon in the middle. Obviously, Scorpions won this quest, so that means Apony is going to have to spin the fate coin. So let's see what happens. And that is a feather. Well, that's going to give Apony one renown. So they will go to the front of the two renown slot, and that puts them currently in first place. All right, all of these fate cards can be discarded as well as the quest. And now we can look out to the overall map and see that all of the quests have been performed, which means it's now time for the end of the age to happen. This means it's now time for the player who has the starting player marker to read and perform the age card that's in the middle of the board. In this case, the yellow player can read Arbiter, which says the first player chooses three demigods and all other players will vote. Now, this means the first player is not going to vote. Sometimes the first player is allowed to vote with these. It just depends on the age card that is flipped up. Now, with this vote, 
Each player, in turn order from the starting player, can add as many cards as they want from their hand into a voting pool. We will then shuffle up the fate cards and see what happens to the chosen three demigods. So the yellow player has to pick three demigods, and they are going to start by picking Pentha. After that, they are going to choose Sagara, and the third one they will select is going to be Naka. After that, it looks like we are first in turn order from the starting player, so we can add as many fate cards as we want into the voting pool. Now, we don't actually care about Pentha, Naka, or Sigara, so I think let's throw a Scorpion card in there in order to try and make them lose Renown. After that, the blue player can add cards if they want, but it looks like they've decided to hold on to this card instead. Next up, green can add, and they are also going to pass on putting cards in. After that, everyone has had an opportunity, so now all of these cards would be shuffled up, but we are the only one to actually put a card in here, which means our opponents are probably going to learn a little bit about where our alliances lie with those three demigods. This is going to be revealed as a scorpion, which means the chosen three demis are all going to lose one renown. Now the way this works when multiple demis lose renown at the same time is you start with the one that is farthest up on the renown track. So, Sagara is going to lose a Renown and go to the front of the line in the new spot, which is down here at zero. Next up, we can see that Pentha is here, so they are just going to go to the back of the line. And finally, it looks like Naka will also go to the back of the line, so the only real impact was Sagara losing one Renown overall. I suppose the other impact is that all of our opponents now know that we likely don't actually care about those three demigods, which is a third of the overall demigods, so unfortunately we did telegraph quite a bit of information to our opponents. Now that the age card has been performed, it's now time to set up for the next age. The first thing that we have to do is discard any remaining quests that are on the board, but obviously there are none, and then we have to discard the city card if it is still out here. After that, in player order, each person is going to draw five cards from the top of the deck and add those into their hand. Now, as you can see, it's possible that we have saved cards from the previous round. Uh, we have two over here, and remember, you can never have more than eight cards in your hand, so if you happen to have four or more, then you won't actually draw the full five. In this case, we have two, so we can draw five, and then we can add these to the hand that we had already. Next up, blue had one, so they can draw five, which is going to bring them up to six. And green has three, so when they add five to that, they will get to their maximum hand size of eight, so that worked out pretty well for them. Once fate cards are drawn, it's now time to see new quests. The way this works is the starting player will draw the top quest from the deck, and then they will choose which region to put this quest down into, as long as that region does not already have a quest. This is Secret of Flight, and it does have a restriction in the middle saying that Isabel has to go onto the slot. After considering the options over here, yellow has decided to add this up into the desert, and after that happens, we now move on to the next player, who is us, and we draw a quest from the top of the deck and add this down. Now we are going to keep doing this until we have the appropriate number of quests out for the player count, and in a four-player game, we are going to put four quests out. So this one is Eruption, and that one needs Namari in the middle. I think that Eruption makes thematic sense over here at the Volcano. Uh, I don't see another reason to put it on a different slot at this point. So yeah, let's go ahead and add this to the Volcano. Next up, Blue has to add a quest down, and this is a Drought. It looks like we're running into a lot of these quests that has a restriction for a specific demigod on them. After considering these options, they are going to put this down into the Forest. And then finally, the green player can draw a quest, and it's Listen to the Stars. Now, they have decided to add this one to the coast. Next up, the starting player can draw a new city card for the next age. This is Call for Heroes, and it does have an ongoing effect for as long as this card is still on the board. It says the first set of three demigods of the same class to simultaneously occupy the city will gain one renown each. So that is definitely something that we all have to consider as we move demigods around in the next age. Speaking of that, we have now entered age 2, and just like the first age, that means the starting player, who is yellow, is then going to draw and reveal the age card for this one. So, this is an age 2 card, and this says Defend Borders. When we focus on the card, it says this will have a global vote at the end of the age, starting to the left of the first player. 
Now, the effects say for the feather that all demigods in the forest, coast, and canyons will gain to renown, and the scorpion side says all demis in the desert, volcano, and mountains will gain to renown. So either way, there is going to be some renown being doled out, and unlike the first age, the starting player will be able to vote in this, and they will vote last. At this point, the yellow player would now take the first turn of the second age, but at this point I'm going to stop playing through the game, and now I'd like to talk about the other two god powers that were not performed in the first age of the game. As you can see, both of these cost three fate cards from your hand, which is probably part of the reason neither of them were used in the first age, and the first of these is Portal. It says you move a demigod to any location or open spot on a quest, you ignore all movement rules or quest requirements with this portal action. That means you could use portal to move a demigod off of a quest where they would normally be locked, and you can also use this to move demigods out of the abyss or the pools. The final god power is transfiguration. That says you can switch the locations of two demigods on the same incomplete quest, and you ignore all quest requirements with that. As you can see, both of these are quite powerful, but of course, there is a steep cost to using them, and in addition to that, you do run the risk of showing your hand by trying to favor one demigod over another with these expensive actions. Well, at this point, I have taught you just about all of the rules to the game, which means the tutorial is coming to a close, but before we end, I think I am going to spoil which demigods each of the players were favoring, because I'm sure you were curious to see what those are. In this case, the yellow player has been favoring Sagara, although Sagara is not doing very well. The green player is favoring Klar, and they did telegraph that pretty solidly, and the blue player is favoring Balan, and they telegraphed that as well. I say that because both of these gained renown from a quest that had only scorpions in it, and I think if the game was to go on, then both of these players would need to do a decent amount of work to try and throw everybody else off the trail and confuse them as to who they are actually supporting. This does mean that if the game was to end right now, then there would be a three-way tie between us with Isabel, green with Klar, and blue with Belan, because all three are in the two renown spot. Now, in this case, Belan is farther to the front of the number two area, so blue would break that tie and they would win the game. Well, at this point, the tutorial is officially over, and I hope that you've enjoyed learning how to play Veiled Fate. As always, I'd like to thank everyone who's been supporting this channel, including these producer-level Patreon supporters. If you would like to directly support the channel and the creation of future videos like this one, then please go to jongetsgames.com support. Also, if you enjoyed this video, please click the like button for it down below, as well as the subscribe button for the channel. Thanks for watching.